So thank you all for coming. My apologies for the slow start here. I managed to touch something wrong on my laptop. Uh, before I begin, I definitely want to thank uh, the crew here at Midwest, both the organizers of the conference and obviously the AV team who just rescued me from myself. Uh, I've spoken at a few conferences. Uh, these guys clearly have their act together. It's been great working with them, um, and they've done everything to make life as comfortable as possible for the speakers, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I would recommend, if you get a chance next year, please come speak at this conference because it's been, it's been great. So we're here to talk about Erlang today. Um, Erlang has a reputation for painful syntax. Uh, honestly, though, that's crap. Uh, it's unfamiliar syntax, absolutely. But there's almost nothing there. I could teach you everything you want to know about Erlang syntax in five or ten minutes, at least most of it. List comprehensions are a little hairy, but everything else five or 10 minutes stops, right? It's just not that difficult. Mark, am I right? Pretty much. Yeah. Mark, Mark's going to be talking about Erlang tomorrow, so definitely come back. Same room, same time tomorrow. But this isn't a talk about syntax. It's a talk about semantics, uh, which are much more interesting than syntax. And it's about simplicity, honestly. So my name is John Daly. I work for Basho. We make REAC, which is a distributed database, and it's built almost exclusively on Erlang. Uh, we have some C and C++ intermingled in there, but the core of the application itself is Erlang. But I want us to pretend for a moment that you don't know what I'm here to talk about. Today, I wanted to design a new language. And this one supports exactly one defensive programming construct, and that's the equal sign. The equal sign is going to represent not only assignment, which we're all familiar with, but it's also going to represent assertion of truth. You have a formula in math, one side is equal to the other side. That's what we're talking about here. It's an assertion that two things are equal. So what's wrong with this code? Hopefully everyone in the room knows there's no way that x can equal x plus one. That's a mathematical impossibility. If your language supports this, your language is broken. This is also not what we're here to talk about. This is a simplified example of defensive programming from the Go Language Patterns website. This is not what I have in mind when I'm designing my new language. This is, in fact, what we're looking for. So let's walk through this code. Obviously, we have a function that creates a database connection. That function we are asserting is going to return two values, an OK atom that says, hey, this actually worked, and the database connection itself that we're going to shove into this variable called handle. If what we get back from that function is not true, we're going to throw an exception. And we'll talk about that. But fundamentally, this is an assertion as well as a program statement. Now, a lot of languages have the concept of assertions. But those assertions are typically extra code that you have to remember to write and that you have to want to write and you have to have time from your boss in order to write. And as importantly, those assertions are commonly turned off in production. Well, in this language, the assertions are built in and they never get turned off and that makes a world of difference. So if we throw exceptions when we encounter falsehoods, when our equations don't line up properly. What do we do with those exceptions? And the answer, at least as far as our simplified example here, is we do nothing. You throw an exception and you don't catch it. In Java, which I'm picking on because it's a very wordy language anyway, um, how much extra wordiness goes in when you throw in all the try, catch, throw type of syntax? How do you find the business logic buried beneath all of the defensive programming. And it's not just Java. There are a lot of languages that are like this. So I'm saying we're going to do nothing to catch that exception. Well, as you almost certainly know, uncaught exceptions lead to crashes, which is typically bad. So in a monolithic application, there are at least two bad things that can come from exceptions. The worst one, I would argue, is not that something crashes. The worst one is that the exception is silently swallowed somewhere. 
the user thinks things are fine because the application's still running, but lo and behold, data corruption sneaks in. You have really no idea what the state of your application is once you've swallowed an exception. Who knows what's going on in that? That's bad. Uh, invalid data is a bad thing. The other bad thing that can happen with uncaught exceptions, again, is crashes. We've been talking about reusable code for many generations of programmers now. We're getting better at it. There are still some challenges. But we almost never talk about rebootable code. How often are you able to solve a problem with your computer by rebooting? Pretty much always, right? I mean, how often does a reboot not solve some sort of transient glitch that you're experiencing with your computer or with your code? If your phone's acting weird, you reboot it. My five-year-old niece knows this, right? Why are we not talking about rebooting our code? Well, luckily, we are today. If your code is divided into small pieces, if these pieces are isolated from each other, if reboots are practically instantaneous, then what's wrong with a crash? If you have Microsoft Word and you're typing along and your spell checker crashes and it immediately reboots, you might not even notice. You certainly don't care. It's still working. Crashes are not bad. They don't have to be bad. So if we're going to go with this let it crash philosophy, we need some things. And first, we need isolation. We need our modules to be distinct from each other. We need supervision. If a part of your program has gone bad, you can't trust it to reboot itself. You need something outside of that, something that's not been corrupted in order to supervise that process. And obviously, we need a fast reboot because you don't want your users, you don't want the rest of the application to notice that things have gone wrong. So digression time. Tandem computers. Who here has heard of tandem computers? A few people. Not Tandy, very different computer company, Tandem. So 70s and 80s, Tandem computers, now part of HP, were designing hardware and software for ATM networks, financial services. Uh, they were doing distributed databases in the 70s and 80s. Jim Gray from Tandem wrote a white paper called Why Do Computers Stop and What Can Be Done About It? So this is what Jim Gray said 30 years ago about reliable computers. He said, design your hardware into hierarchical modules. Have those modules fail fast. If they're not doing the right thing, shut them down. Because as we said earlier, data corruption is an ugly thing. You don't want things, once things break, you want them to die as quickly as possible. Digression from the digression. Basho, we create a distributed database. Distributed database requires multiple servers. A failed server is a wonderful thing. A server that crashes and is not part of your cluster anymore, that's great. We can deal with that fine. That's what a distributed database is supposed to do. A computer that's misbehaving is an entirely different beast. Uh, computers can drop half their packets. Computers could quite literally lose all of the incoming packets but still send outbound messages. Uh, disks can fail in weird ways that aren't up or down. They're corrupt, right? So these are very hard things for our database to deal with. They're very hard things for any distributed system to deal with. So hardware that's dead is a wonderful thing. Don't underestimate the value of a dead piece of hardware. You need to detect your module faults quickly, and you need to have additional uh, superfluous hardware ready for a rapid failover. And he said based on his analysis of his customers' logs, that based on these principles, their computers had a mean time between failure of decades. Now, they also talked about their software, and they followed a very similar approach. They had processes that failed fast, and they had other processes ready to take over for those when they failed. They had roughly four million lines of code. He estimated several thousand bugs still remained in their code despite their testing. And he was able to estimate, based on, again, his analysis of his customer records, 50 years between failures of this operating system. Now, again, this is 30 years ago. Can you imagine today Microsoft or Apple writing an operating system that would run for 50 years between failures? 
right? It's just inconceivable. But they know how to do this. Not my slide, I can't take credit for it, but I absolutely love this poster. Tandem and Erickson both knew, again, 30 years ago, bugs are unavoidable, hardware fails, operators are human. People make mistakes. If you treat failure management as an add-on to your language, as, as something that you'll deal with later as part of QA, I mean, that's, that's the, exactly the wrong approach. You need to design systems, you need to design platforms where failure is expected. It's part of the normal life cycle of your software. Joe Armstrong, when he talks about Erlang, likes to talk about the financial penalties. Ericsson was designing these switches that simply had to always be up. I believe the numbers, and I don't quote me on this, but I believe it was roughly four minutes of downtime was permissible per year, and anything more than that, the financial penalties were in the tens of thousands of dollars. Strong incentives to get their software right. So, returning from the digression, let it crash. What do we need? We need isolation. We need supervision. We need fast reboot. We also want network transparency, and we want explicit state management. I'll talk about those. First, isolation. Fairly obvious, we don't want data corruption to leak between processes. We also want processes to be able to reboot in isolation without impacting anything else. If there are processes that are closely interrelated with the one that crashed, then we'll go ahead and reboot those as well. No big deal. We don't want shared memory. Shared memory is bad. Shared memory leads to, again, data corruption issues spreading throughout your environment. To get shared me memory, we want messaging. And ideally, we want asynchronous messaging because synchronous messaging is fragile, tightly coupled. It's not what we want. We'll talk more. Supervision, as I said, if your process is failing, you can't trust it to reboot itself correctly. And if the process fails, obviously it can't reboot itself, so you need something else to do that. The nice thing about supervisors in Erlang is that it's very simple code. It's very hard to introduce bugs into supervisors. But you can, in fact, supervise your supervisors if you need to. Fast reboot. Anyone care to guess what this slide demonstrates? This is a .NET thread, 64-bit environment, <coughs> roughly 4 megs stack space. 32-bit .NET thread, 64-bit JVM thread on Linux, 256K, 128K for a 32-bit JVM thread. That's an Erlang process. A little bit over a K. This isn't just faster reboots having processes that are a little over a K. This is massive agility. If you have 10,000 inbound connections you need to deal with, you spin up 10,000 processes. No big deal. If one of them crashes, no big deal. You still have 9,999 connections that are working properly. Network transparency. So the industry has tried many times over the years to come up with a way of making remote procedural calls look just like local ones. We've had RPC, we've had CORBA. These things, generally speaking, don't work because the machine boundary is an ugly place. When you're talking to something that's on the other side of the network, there are failure conditions that you never had to dream of with a local computer. There are latencies that you never dreamt of with a local computer. Things just don't work the same when you're talking across the network as they do when you're talking locally. So asynchronous messaging uh, works very well for a local computer because, again, you, you no longer have tight coupling. Uh, you no longer are expecting an immediate response. You send out a message. You hope to get one back. That translates very well to the network. State management. Now, for many OO programmers, state is not part of your normal vocabulary as part of something you think about a lot. Because in an object-oriented program, state is very nebulous. It's amorphous. It's this, it's this representation of every private variable, every public variable, every piece of data scattered through every object in your software. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to pin down, and it changes all the time, virtually without warning. With Erlang and with functional programming in general, state is explicit, it's inspectable, it's easy to unit test. It's a world of difference. If you haven't looked into functional programming, please, please do it. 
This is an email from Mahesh Paolini Subramania, and I probably butchered that, dies way too fast on Twitter, to the Erlang mailing list, talking about other programming languages. Basically what he's saying is, with other languages, with other platforms, with other systems, you can spend your lifetime testing this stuff and still have weird cases pop up and still have systems fail due to do those weird cases. How do you test for random memory corruption from cosmic rays, right? I mean, there are lots of things that happen with computers that you don't anticipate and that you don't test properly for. Jim Gray, in that tandem white paper, talked about Bohr bugs versus Heisen bugs. Bohr bugs are the testable ones. Bohr bugs are the things that you can find with enough careful testing. Heisen bugs are the weird cases you never expect, the race conditions, the cosmic rays, whatever it may be. Jim Gray said, test for those Bohr bugs, but don't worry about the Heisen bugs. That's what the failure characteristics of your hardware and your software are for. That's where the let it crash philosophy comes in because the platform is designed to handle that for you. So there are any number of other interesting characteristics of Erlang to help with everything we've talked about. The most important thing to come out with this is Erlang is not a specific semantic. It's not a couple of cool features. It's a synergy of a lot of very interesting features that collaborate well together to form an environment very different than nearly anything else you've dealt with. Hot code loading, the Erlang REPL shell uh, helps as part of this as well. You can change the behavior of your application on the fly. Um, I can't begin to express how, how useful that is, especially for the uh, customer service support engineers at Basho who have to fix distributed databases on the fly. Uh, garbage collection. So on the JVM, many of you I'm sure are familiar with garbage collection. Uh, Stop the world may uh, ring a bell. It's entirely possible for a large enough environment that when garbage collection comes along, everything crawls to a halt, and you have to wait for the garbage collection to finish. Well, when you have thousands and thousands of small processes, each with their own dedicated memory, garbage collection is trivial. It's just part of the ongoing running of the system, and absolutely not everything grinds to a halt when garbage collection kicks in. OTP. OTP is so deeply embedded in Erlang that frequently you'll see Erlang slash OTP as a way of describing the language. Fundamentally, though, OTP is just a system library. It's a bunch of system libraries. And they encapsulate best practices for building robust distributed systems. Uh, the supervision I talk about is built into OTP. It's just a great battle-hardened library, 30 plus years of software development and something that you can build on top of. Pattern matching. Who's used the language with pattern matching in here? Excellent. Um, of that group of users, how many have only used it in Scala? Okay, good. So pattern matching is wonderful. If you've used it, you've probably liked it. Um, I hope you have. Uh, in Erlang, every, it's, it's everywhere, and it's just such an amazing tool. It makes logic so much easier to follow. And it's great for message passing, because you have a process, and you're waiting for these asynchronous messages to come into your mailbox, and you want to deal with each message type differently. Pattern matching makes it trivial to say, well, when this specific message comes in, this is what I wanted to do. And that's just much of Erlang code is simply pattern matching against incoming values and doing something different based on what's coming in. And symbolic debugging, as I said, Erlang is inspectable. You can poke in, log into a remote server. You can see exactly what's going on. You can see the state of your processes. When Erlang VM does crash, which is very rare, but it does happen, especially out of memory problems, uh, you can actually fire up the crash dump into a web browser. You can see the exact state of every process in the system, and it's usually fairly easy to see, yep, there's that out of memory problem again. The core component that makes all this possible with Erlang, the place where all these synergies come together is the Erlang virtual machine. It's a wonderful platform to work on. Alan Kay famously said, people who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. My corollary to that, people who are really serious about languages should make their own virtual machine. Um, 
As I said, Erlang's a lot of little features individually aren't that earth-shaking, but collectively they build on each other to make a very different approach to software development. We're in a new world with distributed systems, with mobile networks, and multi-core systems. Erlang was really designed for today's world, and it's been around for 30 years. And I think you can see why rebootable code is so rare. Creating a language that embraces failure, it's a lot of work. You know, again, you probably need a VM. You need a lot of interesting language constructs to work with that. You need a messaging model that works with it. Uh, it's much easier to just create a new language that looks a lot like Algol and call it a day. Um, you know, congratulations, one lollipop. Uh, you know, if you're going to do something new, do something different than what everyone else has done before. How I learned to stop worrying and let things fail. Uh, in summary, question your assumptions about software development. There are a lot of fascinating ideas out there that don't get nearly enough airtime. Be open to paradigm shifts. Better yet, create your own paradigm shift. Ask yourself whether you really want to spend the rest of your life trapping exceptions. Erlang's not the end of the story on programming languages, uh, but it's a valuable lesson in the power of synergy, valuable lesson in the power of focused features with a specific goal in mind. Learn You Some Erlang is a fabulous resource for getting a feel for how the language works. It's free online. He also has a, uh, an e-book out. I have a list of Erlang resources at tinyurl.com slash mw erlang. And Brett Victor, uh, if you've not seen any of his talks, I can't recommend them highly enough. Uh, he gave a talk called The Future of Programming, and Erlang makes a cameo appearance. But more importantly, he talks about you know, some things I just highlighted. You really need to think differently about software development. There are a lot of great ideas that have been around for a long time that have been largely ignored. Uh, mind the history of computers. Uh, there are some great ideas out there. There's some very smart people who have been thinking about this stuff for a very long time. So, caveat, there's been lots of oversimplifications here. Erlang does have try-catch. It does have throw. There are ways to do all the things you do traditionally with uh, defensive programming. But uh, most of the time, you can not worry about that. Uh, as I said earlier, same time tomorrow, the same room, Mark Allen will be talking about uh, using Erlang for concurrent development. Uh, also tomorrow at 11 in this room, Andrew Rademacher. Hopefully I got that right, Andrew. Excellent. We'll be talking about uh, Haskell, uh, which is another interesting functional programming language. I tend to think of Erlang as a great functional programming language for beginners to FP because there's not much syntax. The code that you write tends to be largely imperative in nature. Uh, and it makes state management really easy to understand. Uh, Haskell, well, I don't want to say too much because I don't know it, uh, but certainly seems to be more of a step up in terms of complexity uh, from Erlang. If you like hearing about monads, you'll love hearing about Haskell. And again, thank you so much to the Midwest Curve because this has been awesome. So, questions? Come up to the microphone, man. Great talk, thank you. Um, so the, the no crash, or the allow it to crash, don't worry about it scenario, and fast reboot uh, in the context of, say, an environment that's uh, time, very time critical, and if something reboots, there's a, potentially a huge uh, performance hiccup because of recovery. How are there, do you have any tips or notes on how you might handle something like that? So. Typically, the state for each individual process, so, so again, these, the idea is to design a system around lots of small processes. So an individual process should never have much of a recovery time because it's not doing very much. Each process is tightly focused on a, on a relatively small set of operations. Uh, typically, so I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of an example of uh, scenario like that. Do you have any actual uh, examples of something where you, perhaps we could tease this out a little bit? Yes, um, yes, I do. Um, so, for example, uh, think of a trading system and it potentially has lots of order opens, a uh, lot of <laughs> lots of op open sure, orders. Sure. And so, if there is a potentially a crash um, when the system comes up, it has to rebuild that right. that, that state. 
Right, so and that, that again, yeah, so, so again, the, the idea is that the system as a whole doesn't crash, just the individual process that's managing that. So basically you end up resubmitting the order uh, would be a common, common scenario. And it shouldn't take long to, yeah, it, we're talking less than a second recovery time. Um, obviously for a trading situation you wanna be radically less than a second. Uh, Erlang is not a hard real-time system, it's a soft real-time. Uh, so for maximal performance, sometimes it's not the right choice. Uh, but uh, for, for most use cases uh, where milliseconds delay is acceptable, then Erlang would be a good fit. You got a question? So you mentioned that the, the machine boundary is, is a very dangerous place. But in terms of spreading either load across machines or redundancy across machines, um, what is the, the Erlang model for, for distributing beyond a single machine? Sure. Well, as I indicated, network transparency is built in. So when you are sending messages between processes in a system, you, unless you specifically poke at the data structure to know, you have no idea whether that process lives on different machine or not. Um, in order to achieve high availability, you have to have multiple machines, or you have to have something like Tandem built, which was machines with lots of redundant hardware, so one or the other. So the language itself, again, supports sending messages without any, any knowledge of whether that the receiver is on your machine or distributed, which is a, you know, good luck finding many programming languages which have that level of transparency, but admittedly, uh, there's a lot more to distributed code across multiple machines than simply being able to talk between machines. So what Rioc has done, what, what we at Basho have done, we have uh, our own design patterns built on top of the OTP platform, which allow for distribution of uh, data between multiple servers such that it lives on multiple servers and so that you always know where to find it. So typically what people have to do is take the robust foundations that Erlang gives you and come up with your own patterns on top of that. And, and Erlang has some, some very simple syntax to allow you to create what are more or less interfaces in the Java world and uh, define callback uh, syntax and say, I want, you're going to have to deploy this process. Here are, here's the interface of this process. Here's, that gives you enough of a hook to build your own code around that. So you build, you, you design your own patterns on top of it, and then you take advantage of, you know, we use something called consistent hashing, which is an idea that came out of Akamai and was incorporated into the Dynamo white paper from Amazon. Uh, consistent hashing is this notion that when you have the key for a value that you want and you don't know where in your cluster it lives, you can hash that key to come up with a, an integer range, and every computer in the cluster knows, based on that integer range, what machines that piece of data should live on. So there are all sorts of industry standard ideas that you can incorporate, but you do in fact have to build on those. Erlang does not yet have a standardized OTP for uh, the types of problems that you face, uh, data distribution, the types of things you're describing. So you do have to build a lot of that yourself. Or, or take advantage of our code base. So the React core, uh, the, the bulk of React is open source, so take our code and run with it. Uh, there's a gentleman in Germany, Heinz Gies, who has written a uh, virtual machine management platform called Project FIFO, which is built around React Core to take advantage of those, those function, those, that functionality that we've built into it. Yes? Where it's not feasible to reinvent the wheel or update legacy code or legacy applications, could you use Erlang or Erlang processes to supervise non-Erlang processes? Absolutely. Um, there are definitely caveats there. Uh, the Historically, the Erlang scheduler has had challenges when it's managing uh, code that isn't Erlang. Uh, one of the, so the, the Erlang scheduler is, a, is preemptive in the sense that it will actively move processes in and out of its scheduler. However, in order to do that, it relies on something called reductions, which are basically uh, values built into the Erlang libraries which indicate for this function call, this is how much work typically goes into it, so the scheduler will demarcate your process based on that number of reductions. So when you're dealing with external code, it doesn't know what to expect. So you have to be careful about making certain that the C code that you're, that you're supervising 
uh, responds quickly enough that it doesn't lead to something that pleasantly called a scheduler collapse on the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, but there are definitely ways to hook into other languages. There are definitely ways to supervise other languages. And uh, one, of our, one of my coworkers, Steve Vanosky, is building something in the next version of the Erlang kernel. Actually, I think the beta version of it made it into this latest release of Erlang called Dirty Schedulers, which is specifically designed to deal with the problem of external code not, op not returning as quickly as the Erlang scheduler would ordinarily hope for. So yes, the, the short answer is yes, there are certainly ways to do that. Why give a short answer when you can give a long one, right? Anything else? Plenty of time. Well, let me, um, uh, actually, if I could have the display back briefly, let me show off some Erlang code. Uh, I didn't want to dwell on syntax, but I might as well show a little bit of, oops, that's right, I lost everything earlier in my battle to get the display to work properly. And I no longer have the display. Is it possible to get that back? Okay, well, maybe I won't show any airline code. Anyway, thank you very much.